I love to do it. The dentist flat out told me that if I keep chewing at the rate I'm chewing now, he can see in the future, sometime in the future, that uh, I'm bound to get cancer. Now if you open real wide for me. The signs of mouth cancer can be seen after only three years of dipping. Dental pathologist Dr. Ray Melrose checks Pat and Greg for precancerous lesions called leukoplakia. Leukoplakia is a major white patch that the, that the chewing tobacco, the spit tobacco causes. It's a little bit like a callus that you get on your hands. The chronic irritation of the tobacco product really produces a callus in your mouth. Now I'm going to do the same thing for you. Pat was lucky so far. Now it's Greg's turn. I see the little bit of leukoplakia, yeah. and you see it looks kind of, turn your head that way, see how it looks wrinkled? Leathery. Yeah. Leathery, yeah, that's a good word, leathery, it's perfect. And so that's, you got some leukoplakia. I would, I would say it's definitely a side effect of what you've been doing. Now, what do you see here? Yeah. Now, this, this is this, out of, just to orient you, this is somebody's tongue, okay? But this is something else that can happen when you use tobacco products, including spit. This is called a hairy tongue. And these aren't really hairs, but, but they're elongated papillae, the normal structures of, their, of your tongue that are supposed to disappear. But in this patient, they're long and stringy and really ugly, right? How about that one? You could comb it, you could part it. You could do all kinds of interesting yeah. things. And the interesting thing about it here is you can, you can vary the color. Uh, you can have them like that color, or you can have them kind of tan, or even with a little greenish tint to them. Or you can uh, make them really brown and really disgusting. Do you think your girlfriend would really be thrilled about uh, kissing a guy whose tongue looks like that? How about this one? Now, th this is what it can look like. You recognize this? Leukoplakia. This is right where this person puts the pinch, right between cheek here, or the lip and the gum. Here's one. This is not leukoplakia anymore. This is cancer. I got one more to show you that's even more dramatic. This is somebody's tongue. And this entire half of this person's tongue is covered with this cancer. And this is the unique kind of cancer that you get from spit tobacco. It's called verrucous carcinoma because it looks like a big wart, like a big cauliflower. Does that look like a cauliflower, like a giant wart? Yeah. And there's only one way to treat this, a substantial degree of surgery. Let me tell you, this is real life, folks. Rick Bender learned the truth about smokeless tobacco the hard way. Once an aspiring baseball player, he was forced to give it up at the age of 26. What's up, guys? Not too bad, Rick Bender. I first started using what I call spit tobacco now. A lot of people refer to it as chewing tobacco when I was about 12 years old. I mean, I was a ball player, 12, Little League, All-Stars, high school, you know, and it kind of fit in with the game. I was diagnosed with cancer at 26. Ended up going through four surgeries. I lost a third of the tongue. And, Ended up with half of the jaw gone and nerve damage here in the neck and even lost partial use of my throwing arm. I can't even throw baseball anymore. How, how often did you chew? I was up to about a can a day when I finally was diagnosed. But, you know, in high school you start out, can every couple, three or four days, couple cans a week. Then you get to more like can every other day. And, you know, it just keeps rolling on. You keep snowballing into more and more and more. And it has to do with that nicotine thing. Yeah. Did you notice anything wrong with like your lip at all, like while you were dipping? Well, I had this white patchy stuff that happened all the time right where I dipped. And I didn't think much of it at the time. It was kind of thick and leathery. I always kind of figured like callus, like get on your hands. It turned out it was actually precancerous precancer state of the gum tissue. Under the age of 30, the survival rate's almost non-existent with this type of cancer. By all rights, it should have killed me. I've wanted to quit for a while, you know, and so many times I've wanted to quit. You know, after seeing Rick and, you know, face to face, I think this put me over the edge. And I think the biggest weight off your shoulders could be quitting. It's amazing how that stuff can happen, and it can happen to anybody, you know. A lot of people think it won't happen to me, but it definitely can. So what are you going to get Zach for Valentine's Day? Becca and Karen are twins, identical in every way but one. Stick your hand way up the window. I'm Becca and I'm 18 and I smoke about a pack a day. Yeah, 
far enough out for me. I'm Karen, I'm 18, and I'm a non-smoker. No. <laughs> I started smoking about three years ago, and I've never <laughs> seriously tried to quit. As crazy as that may sound, it, it's almost true that smoking has more advantages than disadvantages. <laughs> I mean, day-to-day -day life. To measure how smoking might already be making them different from one another, the twins volunteered to be tested at Lutheran Medical Center in Denver, Colorado. They were tested for lung capacity. Karen, as you might guess, since you have been a non-smoker and you're young, your tests are uh, unequivocally normal. Blast it out. Becca, your tests are technically within the normal range, but they do show some signs of early small airways uh, disease. Then, Becca got a chance to see how smoking just one cigarette affects her body. And that will cause the skin temperature to drop. With each drag, the nicotine in the cigarette begins to constrict Becca's circulation. Infrared pictures of her hand show the changes instantly. You can see the blueness uh, occurring up in her index finger now. The temperature drop is quite significant already. In the time it takes to smoke it one cigarette, Becca's hand turns from a healthy red to an icy blue. I notice we're even getting a little purple in the tips of your fingers, mm -hmm. which is now near the bottom of our scale. Now the non-smoker, if they would wiggle their hands, yeah, we know who it is. Your oxygen level has been dramatically reduced, and that's going to affect your entire body. Get real tight together if you could. Oh, look at our cold nose. <laughs> Keep in there for as long as you can take it. <laughs> oh, man. There is one test left. Dipping their hands in ice water, the twins witness their body's ability to recover and heal itself. A laser imager provides instant pictures of the blood flow to the girl's hands and skin. The smoker is on the left, the non-smoker on the right. You should see an increase in both now, coming out of the cold water. Being a healthy non-smoker, Karen's hand returns to normal as soon as the ice water is removed. Look at how fast yours came back. Five minutes later, Becca shows no sign of recovering. You hear about lung disease and you hear about heart disease, but you don't hear about the blood flow or, I mean, that's something that takes place right now. I mean, you know, lung cancer could be in your future, but right now, you can't even warm up after being cold. <laughs> Cigarette ads promise a smooth, rich taste. Well, how tasty could 4,000 chemicals be? Especially if 50 of them are known to cause cancer and 200 of them are deadly poisons. Here are just a few of the highlights from tobacco's death list. Form of dehyde. <laughs> I can't even pronounce it. <laughs> no, not really. Um, um. Oh, that's nasty. <laughs> Propylene glycol. Glycol. <laughs> I don't know. The, uh, what's called? Antifreeze. Yeah, antifreeze. They don't even let dogs around. I here. know. <laughs> Arsenic. Uh, that's what it yeah, is. Rat poison. Rat poison. Oh. Plutonium 210. Plutonium 210. Used to make nuclear, nuclear bombs. bombs. What? In a cigarette? Let me ask you a question. If you know how hard it was to quit smoking, would you even start? I smoked cigarettes for 20 years, and when I finally quit, I got a glimpse of what a junkie's life must be like. Most teen smokers think they won't be smoking five years from now. Well, guess what? They will be. Tobacco is just like any other drug. It's a habit that takes your money, your health, your looks, and eventually your life. Smoking, truth or dare? The truth is, the dare will kill you. Hey! I need my nicotine! Right now! Nicotine? Nicotine, nicotine. You all know what nicotine is? Yep, yeah. nicotine is a drug. It's in cigarettes. Once a researcher for cigarette giant Philip Morris, Victor DeNoble now travels the country telling teens the truth about tobacco and addiction. You've never seen a brain before? No. Oh, are you kidding me? This is a person's brain. This is a person's half a brain, actually. It sits in your head like this. Here you have a substance that's biologically active, nicotine. 
We know it goes into the brain. We know it binds to certain things. It latches on to your brain structures, and it induces chemical changes in your brain. You know, so does cocaine. So does alcohol. So does heroin. So why is this any different than that? It's not. Call it addiction, call it dependence, call it a habit. I don't care what you call it. Okay? Basically, you're drugging a person's brain. A cigarette is not a cigarette. A cigarette is six, eight, or ten unit doses of nicotine. So if you smoke ten cigarettes a day, ten cigarettes is 80 brain injections. So this is not something that's easy to quit. The kids that say they're going to quit in five years have not quit. Supermodel Christy Turlington knows all too well the addictive powers of nicotine. Today, she's volunteered to make a very personal anti-smoking commercial for the Centers for Disease Control. Well, I started smoking around 13 years old. I think the reason I started smoking was probably because my father. My father smoked, you know, my whole, you know, upbringing. He was sort of the person that I, I modeled myself after, and um, I looked up to him in a lot of ways. And he was sort of a, you know, very good-looking man, you know, led this sort of very free lifestyle, and he smoked. Hi, thanks. In my life, there are two people in my family who quit smoking, me and my dad. For me, it took seven years. When I finally did quit for good, I knew it was one of the biggest accomplishments of my life. My dad, it was different for him. He stopped December 1996. <laughs> Six months before he died from lung cancer. I don't want to die a painful death. I want to live as long as I can healthy and do what I want to do for as long as I can. And if the I knew... The chances are there, but why is it a big deal that teens smoke? I mean, they're, they're, I have had tons of friends die of, in car accidents and being shot, etc., etc., and they didn't even pick up a cigarette. Okay, a little bit faster. Sometimes when I talk to kids, they say, well, you know, you've got to die sometime, everybody's got to go some way. I could walk outside of my house tomorrow and be hit by a truck. I'd pick the truck. Pam Laffin is only 28 years old. A truck kills you instantly. Emphysema kills you slowly for 20 years. So it's not the dead part that's the bad thing, it's the dying. Shannon's 17, she's my cousin. She started smoking around the time that I was diagnosed with emphysema. And I worry about her. I think I can go three and a half hours without smoking a cigarette. Yeah. No way, they smoke all throughout that movie. I wish we had a ramp. First, I developed bronchitis. I was 21. This doctor showed me a chart and just told me all these technical terms, and I said, big deal. I laughed, and I said, so I'll quit smoking when I get emphysema, because, you know, then I'll be on oxygen. I'll have to. I was diagnosed with emphysema when I was 24. The only reason that they could find was because that I had smoked. When I said I was definitely going to quit smoking, they started to talk about lung transplant. But then when I did have my transplant, my appearance changed drastically. I woke up one morning and my face had doubled in size overnight. And I ended up gaining a lot of weight and losing all of my self-esteem and losing all of my friends. The doctors talked about a 40% chance of making it through the first year. And 60% chance of making it past five years, I thought I'll be the exception. And I thought that right up until the day that I got sick this past October. Despite some of the best medical care in the world, Pam's body is rejecting her transplanted lung. Shannon provides moral support as Pam undergoes tests to monitor her condition. Emphysema is like holding your breath all the time. It's one of the most frightening things I think I've ever experienced. Hold the breath out. Just keep going, keep going, relax. I live my life like a person at least twice my age. Two days later, Pam undergoes a bronchoscopy. It's a procedure she's been dreading. The results of the test will tell if her lung can still keep her alive. I live, I think, month to month, you know, or even I can look forward to next year. But I really can't look at five years or ten years. Three days later, the test results are in. 
Pam and Shannon ride to the hospital where the doctor has requested a private meeting. I've been thinking about it. It just makes me nervous whenever I light a cigarette, I think twice. I'm just like, okay.